Welcome, Aradhya, to another interesting debriefing session. Uh, congratulations on your 7.30 Q15 V39. How do you feel? I feel pretty good, to be honest. I mean, I was pretty elated after I received my score. And it was great to look at a 7.30. I mean, I've never done that in my mocks earlier. So I was pretty happy with my performance. And, and that's especially actually... with my quant. Right, and that's actually a 130 yeah, point improvement uh, from the 600 uh, that you got on your GMAT in September. It is, it is, it is, it is fantastic. I mean, and um, uh, plus the fact that I gave it at home, it was pretty comfortable and I was comfortable with everything that I had went through the process. I mean, it was a great, it was great. Got it. I can see the happiness that's that's coming out in your face. Uh, let's talk about your GMAT journey a little. Let's talk about before eGMAT. And this is before your 600 sure. as well, right? So talk to me about how you plan to take the test. Why did you plan that? And how did you eventually end up here? So um, I planned because I wanted to go abroad straight after my um, bachelor's degree. And um, I had other friends taking G uh, uh, taking their coaching from GMAT as well, eGMAT as well. That's why and uh, I consulted the GMAT forum as well for uh, many of my doubts. And uh, from what I recommend, I got the general recommendations that I got for eGMAT were pretty positive. And uh, especially when I talk about the verbal section, which was personally the weakest for me, I think uh, eGMAT seems appropriate to me in general. Got it. Understood. So and then so you decided to kind of choose eGMAT, of course, basis of referrals and what you read on G, uh, GMAT Club. Mm -hmm. um, you signed up with eGMAT. What did you do after that? Um, so in the beginning, I did only the, I only did only the questions and all for the first two months when I signed up with the eGMAT, I only did the questions that were available, which were available. Like there were a lot of questions, hundreds of questions that were available. It's just that I didn't go through the entire process properly. That's what I was lagging when I gave my first attempt. That's why I was underprepared. But um, then I wrote back to you guys. And uh, that's when uh, the team told me that you should follow the entire process properly. Like take one thing at a time. Start with uh, SC and then do the CR and then do the RC. And then I did the process uh, properly. And then that's what helped me get through the right, you know, get to the right point in the right journey for what I wanted to achieve in the GMAT. Understood. So tell me something like what, when you bought the course and you started off studying on your own, what propelled okay. you to just practice questions? Like, did you feel that that was the right way to do it? If so, why? Yes, uh, I did. I actually thought because uh, earlier when I used to, you know, study in school or even study for the exams, I thought that because I generally had a good, good cross in my math section. So I thought that practicing math in general would be similar to practicing verbal in general and it was it it had a lot of difference and uh, while i did not i was uh, i thought i was pretty thorough with the concepts of the gmat but actually i wasn't because that that is what what was reflected on my score when i gave the first attempt of gmat right and and you practiced like hundreds and hundreds of questions and then you went and took the test right and you got a 600 so that mm -hmm. was a q47 and a v27 uh, 24, 25, I don't remember 24, you, something like that. So mm -hmm. now you've, you've practiced so many questions, you know, your quant is in a good place. How did you feel at that point after, you know, practicing all of those questions and then getting a 600? Um, I, I thought that what I was doing was completely wrong because, uh, when I, when I spoke to a few people on, uh, when I spoke to my friends who had actually achieved something, uh, right in the GMAT. And uh, when I spoke to the, when I wrote to the EGMAT, I understood that there was a process. And when I started actually attending the lectures and doing the course diligently, that's when I understood where I was going wrong. Because in the second attempt, I did not do as many questions. I probably, in each, for each section, I must have done probably like 40, 50 questions each. And that was it. Because st completing stage two, after completing the stage two of EGMAT, I was pretty thorough with the concepts. And uh, I mean, when I went through, when I was revising also, while just like three, four days before the exam, while I was going through the course again and revising my concepts, that's when I felt confident that I know the concepts thoroughly and I don't need to do anything more. 
So that's when I thought that initially my approach was completely baseless because knowing a lot of questions doesn't necessarily help you do the GMAT right. Got it. I think uh, this is actually a big lesson for a lot of people out there because this is exactly what they do. They kind of use the course and say, listen, mm. I have thousands of questions on Scholaranium. Let me just practice these and go into the test, right? Now, when it you scored a 600 and, and score that B2425, you wrote to us. I remember that very day, same day you wrote to us uh, at mm. support. Now, take me through how, how did support handle that query? You know, because it's, it's a strategy question. The listener, I'm at 600. How do I get to the next mm. level? Take me through that entire journey. So um, when I wrote to the EG mat, uh, I used to get replies within the day itself. And uh, they used to send me the recorded videos on how to, how should I go about doing progress in the entire course. So earlier, so I started, I had done like 50% of the uh, sentence correction course. And, uh, and first, when I wrote to them, they asked me, to get my ESR report. That is the first report that we get for the GMAT, the comprehensive one. So when I sent them the report, I, they identified, even I did, like both of us, we collaborated and identified where I went wrong in the first section and what I genuinely, what is genuinely weak and what I should be working on right now. So what did you find there? So, so yeah, so we, find, we found out that my CR was incredibly weak. And I was attempting and I was uh, doing all that in a hurry. I wasn't nearly focused as, should, as I should have been in the test itself. In fact, overall, I was just generally unprepared and I, I was doing a lot of errors, taking too much time on irrelevant questions. So um, so the first thing was getting my entire, score, entire understanding of the GMAT, right? So and they took me through the, so they asked me to get a, you know, CR, CR course to get through this. So I started from the top and ended in the ended like seven, eight days. And then I completed the stage two and I was pretty thorough with my concepts. So that's when I started feeling more confident and I started doing more RC passages. The next uh, RC course, I did that again. I did that in a time, uh, in a span of like seven, eight days again. Hmm. So that makes it 16 to 20 days in total. And that was pretty good for me because I had to the in three days, which was really beneficial, and uh, I started gaining more concept, more confidence over the thing, and then I started doing, uh, and then I gave a mock just to test out how everything. So that's when I scored a six ninety on my first mock. So I felt I started feeling like everything's coming in place now, and I started doing. And then uh, I believe you get the. Then I believe GMAT updated the quant section, and uh, that's. That also helped me while I worked on my the numbers, number properties, and um, algebra part. It improved as well. So now there's two parts of your journey, right? The first part is where you practice all of these questions, you went and gave the test. Then the next part is you actually did the course, then you practiced to it. It's not mm -hmm. like you didn't practice. What was the difference mm -hmm. between you doing, you know, approach one versus approach two? So in the approach one, I was uh, genuinely. When I think now that I think about it, actually I was completely baseless when I was doing the questions in my first part of the journey. Whereas in when I was doing the second part of the journey, I had a proper set in mind that I have to read the question, I have to understand it, like doing the reading strategies, and then I have to get to a pre-thinking. Everything was timed that I was doing in like 15 seconds or 10 seconds straight. I was reading in a minute doing uh, pre-thinking in 15 seconds and eliminating the answer choices simultaneously. So that was really great for me. I mean, I, I was timing well and uh, I was understanding well. I mean, earlier when it was just reading blindly, I was just reading blindly. I was just practically basic comprehension skills that, that were being applied. Whereas in the second part, I was pointing out what, what, to know, what I should write on the whiteboard and what I should note down, and then what is actually relevant in the question. I mean, I was seeing the correct phrases that I should use for the answer of the question. Got it. And was there any particular part of the course that kind of, you know, helped you get there? I mean, because at first you didn't, you didn't have those concepts, but now you did. So mm -hmm. how did it help? So, um, 
Okay, so one thing that I think made a lot of difference was keeping an analog. I mean, uh, for CR and uh, for CR especially, I was just a lot of time saver for me. Even in the last part of the section, I did revise my, I mean, in the last part, like last few days, I had mm -hmm. revised my analog of what mistakes I shouldn't be doing and what mistakes I did in the past. And uh, I went through the wrong questions and the right questions. Cementing quizzes, I cannot even, I cannot stress on how much cement, cementing quizzes were helpful in the entire process. Earlier, I was uh, practicing a mixed, mixed quizzes, which were not really helpful because they did not really brush up the entire concept of it. And um, sometimes you get one right and then you get other one wrong. That's just useless because eventually that's a fluke. That's how you're getting that one right. But when you do the cementing right, you, you're getting 70, 80% of questions can correct consistently. That's when you know that you're doing the right thing. Understood. So, I mean, I mean uh, that's what I recommended. Like one of my friends and one of my, uh, one of my friends, they asked me like after that I'm done with the GMAT. And that's what I said. EGMAT scores of SC and CR are brilliant. Like, there are must-do. Got it. Got it. I, I really like the part where you mentioned your error log and how you used it at the end to kind of, of course, revise. So yeah. take me through how you used your error log to revise towards the end or also when you were doing cementing. So um, now when I opened my error log, I also opened the uh, respective, you know, What's the cementing quiz yeah. that I practiced at the time. So while I was doing the error log, I was also, so identifying the questions that I did wrong and the right, where I spent too much time or did something that I shouldn't have done, even in the right questions. So I was correctly seeing what I should have, what I've been, what I should have been seeing all the time. So that's when I started gaining more understanding and just the, just the fact that I was going through the process. So it was just clicking in my mind, like, yes, I have to do this right. I have to do this right. One, two, three points, everything. Got it. And uh, we're going to touch upon two more points as well, but I want to talk a little bit about your journey. So you started working on CR mm -hmm. and then of course you reached out to us with your error log and so on and so forth. Tell me how we kind of took that and told you what your next steps were. What was your journey like? Uh, so essentially I was asked to, and so I don't remember the person who helped me, but uh, I'm really grateful for that though. So they, he made a video for me explaining on how to go about the process. So I do the stage too well and how should I go about, how should I go about attending the CR passages in general or how should I go about understanding them? It was more like a one-on-one -on -one session I was, as I would expect from a coach. Hmm. So that was really great. And then when I, when I was done with the question or when I was done with the part that I was supposed to do, I would uh, eventually ask them for the next thing that I should do. So they would send me the next next milestone that I had to set for me and uh, mm -hmm. then the next and then the next. So that milestone approach, setting milestone approach really worked for me because um, I was making progress. I was making a consistent four hour daily progress, which was really beneficial when I was doing questions down the line or, you know, doing the mock tests. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think what I need to emphasize here is that milestone plan is not a day wise plan. It's we give you a milestone mm -hmm. and there's a it list of not. tasks and, and you decide when to do that. Yes. Right? Got yes, it. Yes, yes. Got it. Now let's talk a little bit about your quant. Your quant is your strong suit, right? And you're yes. always doing well on it. Um, so. Tell me how you managed to use the quant 2.0 course to kind of get to that Q50 level because the Q50 is pretty rare on the GMAT. Mm -hmm. How did you manage to use that and, and get to Q50? So um, essentially what I practiced on GMAT was uh, were the parts that I was weak with. So when the ESR report, when I see the ESR report, I was doing pretty well in the geometry section because I scored 100%. And even the advanced questions, I scored 100% correct. So I didn't really essentially focus a lot of the, on those parts, but algebra and the number properties, those were crucial components because like, we get like 20 questions, like 15 to 20 questions of number properties and algebra combined, which is a lot, which mm. makes up a lot of tests. So I thought that I should genuinely properly focus on that. 
so i attempted the parts that i, I was weak with and uh, so um, the update really you know helped me understand the quant well like where because i was already confident so the um, the update really minimized the time that i should do the quant in got it um, so you're talking about so pace so i did the application files more compared to the concept files got it got it um i think uh, the the new system has diagnostic quizzes and now we have pace where mm -hmm. it actually tells you what files you can skip so it saves you a ton yes. of time especially when you're good at quant right you don't want to go through everything mm -hmm. so that makes a lot of sense uh talk me through how you prepared for the test towards the end right how many mocks did you take what was your routine like and then your exam experience I think uh, yes, sir. You know, you were not yeah. audible. Got it. So, talk to me about how you prepared towards the end. How, how, and when did you take mocks? What was your routine like towards the end of the prep? And then, what was your exam experience? So, in the last fifteen days of my preparation, so I just I ended my exams on uh, like tenth, and during the exams as well, I was continuously going through the GMAT concepts in general. And uh, in the last fifteen days, I was taking a mock. Every third day, and uh, like there are six mocks, so I consider I you know I did all the mocks in the last six days. Makes sense. In the last fifteen days, so that makes sense. That made sense to me, and like because that's where I feel confident. I mean, doing the mocks right is, and uh, what I feel is doing the MBA mocks is the most realistic, gives you the most realistic stand of where you are. Like that is, I think that is imperative while preparing for the GMAT. So that gave me a lot of confidence as well. And uh, when I give the mock, I used to revise and uh, what I used to note down of how many questions I got wrong and what type of questions I got wrong, especially in the verbal sections. So and then I used to go back to the GMAT, revise those concepts again, do a few do do a few quizzes related to those topics, and um, then eventually when I was thorough with those, and then I would give the mock again. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. So I think that that's like, that's a plan that you know the strategy team does share with a lot of students as well. That this is how you kind of should mm -hmm. do it towards the end. Um, perfect. And I'm I'm so happy that we got to talk to you today. And it's it's been a very nice and interesting uh, conversation. Any last takeaways or tips that you would want to give to your fellow test takers to ace the GMAT? I do. I do. Actually, um, I think the GMAT online system is very efficient. I would highly recommend the GMAT online exam system for the people who are at least who have their centers at least 200 kilometers away. Because in the first, when I gave the test first, I mean I really struggled with the process because I had to take a I had to take trains or flights or travel by car just a day before the test, and then I have to come back after that. There's a lot of sleep deprivation, in, you know, included in that, and that hurt me a lot. So. I mean, all of those factors combined makes a lot of difference. Over, apart from that, I mean, focus is really important. Not panicking, understanding the when you're confident in yourself and how you're doing it, it's really important. Being ready with the all the material that you have to carry to the center in just two days before, it's really important. All the minor things, I think, make a lot of difference. The psychological effects and everything. Those things are, I think, primary reason you can get success in the GMAT. Got it. I think uh, very, very valuable points. A lot of people travel before, you know, they go and take mm -hmm. their test and that does matter. It's not like it doesn't. Yes, sir. Um, anyways, uh, congratulations again on your 7.30. We're supremely happy for you. Thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing some good news about you, about your MIM applications. Thank you so much, sir.